want to talk today about blurred vision and about how our vision can be blurred. I think actually Mike Paul spurred this message in my life because I know they got some eye problems and uh, vision problems, I should say. And I'm, I'm going to give you the answer to it first. It's Second Corinthians. I'm going to start with this verse and I'm going to end with this verse. It's Second Corinthians five seven it says, "For we walk by faith." and not by sight. And I like the Proverbs 29, 18, which everyone knows, without that vision or sight, people lose hope or people perish. So, Father, I thank you for your word this morning, and I pray you would help me to communicate what I believe is your thoughts in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember I told you, second coming of the Lord, I, I was well-intentioned this week, but I really feel I want to end this month. For me, Pastor will be, Ben will be preaching next week on this note. The dreaded eye exam, adults, some children, many teenagers have gone to the eye doctor, the ophthalmologist, and we've gone through that test. I'm like, I got to go every year, so I'm going to share with you what happens. Make an appointment a year in advance. You get in there, and when they call your name, you thought you won the lottery because you get to go in. And when you go in, they ask you, what are you doing here? And then... I hate when they do this, but the doctor comes in, and he begins to bring out this this white this chart is on the back, and it starts with big letters in black, white background, and then it goes down, it descends down, and it gets smaller and smaller, and when I walk in that room, in my mind, I don't know why I want to cheat, I look at that and try to memorize it. I know it's not a good thing, and by the time he gets to me, I forget anyway, so it's one of those things, and then... He says, look at those lines, and you get the first one right. And as you go on and on, the L looks like a T, the O looks like a Q. You begin to apologize, and on it goes. Then the next thing you know, he's putting these drops in your eyes. How many like that? And you think you're done, he puts another drop in your eye. And, and the whole thing is they're trying to improve our vision, and we want to be 20-20 vision so we can see clearly what's in front of us, and we can see clearly what's behind us, what's in, in, you know, in front and over. And I want 20-20 vision. I don't have it, but we're working on it. And they can correct things by glasses. How many have glasses on today? I already know I can see. And some people wear contacts, and there's surgery. I've had, I have, I've had cataract surgery when I was in my early 40s, and I didn't know I couldn't see. But I can tell you this, when they took that patch off my eye, I told Pat, you got to clean this carpet because there was different colors than what I ever could see because sometimes sight is so gradually lost, you don't know you lost it. And so they can do implants, they can do all kinds of things, and the whole idea is to get our vision better. We want keenness of vision. And when, when I get here, what I'm, I'm going to switch this over to spiritual diagnosis of what are we seeing. And my goal is to get you to see, spiritually speaking, 2020 vision. So you can see what's in front of you, and you can see what the future is. And I hope I can help you today. And again, the first one is spiritual nearsightedness. Is anybody up there? All right, thank God. There it is. Yeah, keep going. Ah, one of those things. You can figure it out. Okay, spiritual nearsightedness. You can only see clearly things that are very close to you. The further away things go, the blurrier they become. Anybody know what that is all about? The spiritual application. Sometimes we live in a world today where hurts come like unbelievable. I want you to think of this. Think about if there's a situation where you're sick, whether you have this, that, or the other thing, all you can think about is that. It becomes right here, and you become angry, you become frustrated, you can't see in front of you. Or your children are misbehaving. I know that doesn't happen to you. Heck, I got 40-year-olds that are misbehaving. But their children misbehaves, and all you can see is what is in front of you. Your problem is all that exists. And now we have, we've had elections, we've got COVID-19, and all we can think about is that, and we can't see in front of us, we're consumed by whatever it is. If, you know, if you're going through a divorce, if you're going through a crisis in life, that gets our attention, and we can see that. 
But when we're in that mist, we can't see what's in front of us. There's a nice man in the Bible. His name was Job. It's a book everybody tries not to read, but it's there, so we're supposed to read it. And when you get to the first chapter of Job, it starts off like, hey, Job's a wonderful man. He's blessed. He's prosperous. God loves him. Everything is going good. He's prosperous. No one's better than him. And I don't know how, the, how it worked, but there was a conversation in heaven where Satan approached God and said, hey, you think he loves you? Let me touch his life, touch his possessions. I guarantee you he'll curse you to his face. So in one day, if you read the book, you know, in one day, everything he owned, his crops, his livestock, everything was gone. Everything was wiped out. His finances were wiped out in one day. And not only that, every one of his children died in one day, tragically died in one day. And all he was consumed with, for good reason, is what was happening to him. But he still maintained his integrity to God. He didn't curse God. But then the devil had another conversation. Let me touch his body. Let me get him sick. He'll curse you to his face. So anyway, in the second chapter, Job broke out in the boils, and he began to curse God. He began to scrape himself. And he was consumed by what is in front of him. You know, when I had whatever I had, when I had surgery that Kim did to me, year, I don't even remember what year it was, but I remember looking out the hospital room and thinking, watching people come to, and go to work, I was thinking, man, would it ever be nice to be able to get up and go to work? And as I was sitting in my house a few weeks ago thinking this is never going to end, I thought, wouldn't it be nice to get up and go to work? All I could see was right in front of me. Hey, here I am. I'm working. But we can't see what's ahead. It's called nearsightedness spiritually. Can I tell you, is there a financial crisis that hits you and that's all you can think about? You couldn't see the future. Can I tell you, God's got some plans that you don't know about. So we got to be able to see eternity. we got to be able to see the future. we got to be able to see that God has something better. I was telling the guys, I don't want to embarrass the boys, but I'm going to embarrass them anyway. There's bubble gum in my office after service. You can go get some. But I don't see Trevor here, but Trevor and Jacob right now, the two. Julia's already running sports in college, but, but Jacob's got this big uh, paper right up about how he could possibly become a pro someday. And he had, I'd say, 50 or 60 college pursuing him, and he verbally agreed to one. And I told Jacob, I said, man, you didn't even try that hard. And then there's poor little Trevor. But then he told me he was. He just didn't show up. But then there was Trevor. I thought, man, this kid works hard. The coaches kind of ignore him. You know, I was thinking through Marysville and different things. I said, this poor guy doesn't get a chance. And I sat down with uh, uh, Trevor, oh, probably six months ago. I said, ah, neither one of you are going to go to college and play sports. I said, don't worry about it. He said, ah, Papa, I'm going to do it. So anyway, he worked hard, and he, he signed on the dotted line to pray for a Christian university baseball, both of them. See, I could see Jacob because he's got that rocket for an arm. And I couldn't see, I couldn't see Trevor as hard as he worked. He just couldn't get anybody's attention. But to me, it's a double bonus because he gets to play baseball, gets a scholarship, and he gets to go to a Christian university. So I'm thrilled with both of them. I couldn't see far, but he could see it. So I'm saying sometimes when we go through trials in life, all we are consumed with what's here. God's got plans up there. We got to get our vision up there. We got to correct it so we can see it. How many believe that? So I'm a blessed man. I've got three grandkids playing sports in college. Hallelujah. But do I care if they become pros? No. Do I care if they, yes, I do and I don't because I'd like to get an autograph. But, <laughs> but my vision is this. I want to see all 10. I'm proud of Jimmy because he's going to be an electrician. I can get more out of him than I can out of these baseball players. <laughs> I want to see them serving the Lord with all their heart, soul, and strength. So I'm thankful for that, but I'm looking beyond that for something even better, something more grander. So sometimes this gets our attention, and all we can see is what's near. And we look down there, and everything's blurry. Can I tell you, God's 
got plans if you can get out your vision and see what's up the road. We got to correct it. If I got to wear glasses to see the future, spiritually speaking, I'll wear glasses to see it. So that's one thing. I don't know how many of you are spiritually nearsighted, but there's hope for you, amen? And then there's spiritually farsighted. You know what that means? You know what farsighted means? You can see things clearly that are far away, but things near to them are blurry. Some, someone wrote it this way. Some say they're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Basically saying this, and it's kind of a strong statement, but it just simply says, man, all you think about is heaven, and everything's going to hell around you. you got to do both. you got to be able to see what's in front of you as long and, and see what's ahead. You know what? I'm 68 now. Man, I can't believe I'm saying that. 68 years old. Oh, by the way, no tuna fish, all right, when you send food over the house? <laughs> or salmon. I shouldn't have said it because I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Somebody shout amen, hallelujah. But they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. They're, they're certain about eternity, but they leave things to go. This was my goal, and I failed many times. Pat and I, we decided. I was mentored by, well, Lynn White. Actually, Reverend Shinzing was the first. He had about seven kids. He worked. I never seen a man work harder at a church than he did. But in the end, most of his kids hated him, literally hated him. And uh, it was kind of rough when they came to town. And then I moved on, and Lynn White did it. And I liked his family structure. I liked what he did. He was great. Then I worked for a guy named uh, Pastor Muirhead, worked out of Warren Assembly of God. And he was more of a cultured, polished man. So I tried to pick up some of those things, but they didn't stick. But together... When it was all said and done, here's what I thought. I want to go, I feel called to the ministry. This is my, I can see that here. But in the end, I want my kids to like me. I don't want to ignore them. So I made it my goal, our goal, that when the kids are in an activity, we're going to go. When the kids do this, we're going to be part of it. And I love Sherry, but I hated cheerleading. I didn't like her in those short dresses. It made me sick, you know. That's the way I felt. And pom-poms, and I had to go to those competitions at the colleges, and I thought, oh, Lord, help me. But we were there. Amen? We were there cheering her on. Do that flip. Do the – give me an F. Give me an A. Firewall High School, man. So all those things. And Jim with basketball, I mean, we used to see his name in the paper because he'd have 20, 30 points. I'd had guys from the assemblies. We'd be up at uh, – uh, where we go on our retreat saying, hey, is that your son? And I said, yeah, he's scoring all these points in high school. So it was fantastic. But he kissed too many girls and got that disease. I forgot what it's called, but yeah, mono. So that kind of wiped his senior year out. I told him not to do it, but he did anyway. So, but when we look, you know, Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good. To them that love God and are called according to his purpose. So can we see even when things look blurry, God's got a plan. Whether you're nearsighted or farsighted, we're going to get through this thing. Many of you are so disappointed about the election. Hey, get over it. God's got surprises in, in store. There's other things happening that you don't know about. God knows what he's doing. He's sovereign in all things. I'm not going to argue with him. He knows the beginning from the end. You thought you'd never get through that trial. You're going to get through it. And I want some of you to understand, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Steve Furick, head of Elevation Church. How many have ever heard, heard of that? Elevation worship is kind of a big deal. I was watching him this morning. Pastor, what do you watch that young guy for? He's Assembly of God. That's why I watch him. Are you biased? Yes, I am. I like people that I know where they're going when they talk. But he said this, as a young boy growing up in the church, when they would sing hymns, he said, I just was bored stiff and didn't pay attention. But he said, now I'm taking those old hymns and I'm writing, rewriting them in a sense that because they're so rich, they're so deep. I, when they sang that song this morning, both songs, my heart beated a little bit faster. 
because at the end, here's my, here's my far side, and as I can see way out there, this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Whatever happens in America, this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Whatever happens in China or Russia or Vietnam or whatever other place, my story is the story of redemption through Jesus Christ, my Lord. He is awesome. He is awesome. And as I look straight ahead, and I see those boys playing baseball, I am going to follow them, and I'm going to be praying for them. I can't tell you, somebody's praying for me because I've been praying for this church. And when I say the church, I'm talking about the people that are in it, praying that God would get a hold of you, that he would give you 20-20 vision, because some of you are stuck. So many people sent me videos to watch. I think, good grief. And I watched them. But someone not from this church sent me another one, and I thought, who on God's green earth would follow this guy? He looked like he came from the middle of the woods. And he's saying, I'm not apologizing for what I said about Donald Trump being elected for the second time because I spoke the word of God. In other words, he's saying his word is the word of God. You know what I did? Bang, shut it off right then and there. I said, who would follow this guy? He looked like that guy that got arrested at the Capitol with all the hats on and stuff. I mean, come on, Christians, use common sense. Quit following every voice. You are who you listen to. And so I want the voices. Pastor, who do you listen to? I listen to John Hagee. I liked him when he was fat. He preached the word, and he let us have it. I like Steve Furyk. He's contemporary, but, man, he preaches the word. I like Jensen Franklin. He's Church of God. Church of God, Assembly of God are the same. The government's a little bit different, but the beliefs are the same. I follow people that I know their doctrine is right on the money. I like Tony Evans. He's Baptist. I like Tony. He's, I said it. He is Baptist. I tried to talk Roger into that. He's, he, Roger thinks he's AG, but he's Baptist. But I think he's a spirit-filled Baptist. There's a little difference. But I follow these guys. I listen to these guys. I like Pat Robinson. I don't agree with everything he says, but I like him. And there's a couple prophetic people that I enjoy and I listen to. But what I'm saying is I want to see what's close. I want to see what's far. Amen. So remember, don't throw away the hymns. Rewrite them to our contemporary culture. I think you'll find out people turn on. When they know what something is. Oh, I'm telling you. This is my story. This is my song. Mm. And to hear my granddaughter up here singing it makes my heart go pitter-patter. Here's a gal that used to steal food and hide it under her bed. <laughs> they would find food a month. She was like a squirrel. <laughs> now you can't get her to eat that kind of food. Let me know you don't want to be related to the preacher. Man. <laughs> well, the yeah, here's the Apostle Paul. Now, listen to me. Apostle Paul went on two mission. Well, he went on several missionary journeys. The first one, he took a man with him named John Mark. And John Mark, if things got hot, things got persecuted, he decided he had enough. He went home, and it was a disappointing thing. And the Apostle Paul had no compassion because when they went on the second missionary journey, he decided, or Barnabas decided, I want to take John Mark. Paul said, no way. I don't want to take some baby that i got to wipe his nose. we got hard work to do. I'm not taking him with me. And they began to argue back and forth. You see, Paul couldn't see his redemption. Paul couldn't see that he could make, him, make something out of himself. So he let it go. They split up and went different. Paul went with Silas. And you know the story. But if you read the book of Timothy, in the book of Timothy, you see Barnabas was an encourager. And he saw something in that young man that no one else saw. He saw that this guy could be something for the kingdom of God. He wanted to mentor him. He wanted him to redeem himself. He wanted to take him through. Paul didn't have time for that. So Paul, he just couldn't see. He was far sighted. He couldn't see what's here. He was just goal-oriented if you can't make it. That's the way it is. And when he got to the book of Timothy, 
Paul says, let John Mark bring this for me because he's faithful. He's a profitable servant. Aren't you glad that we need to be balanced? That, and here's what I said in the morning service. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to embarrass people. Going through, I've been here 25 years. Actually, I can't even believe it's been that long. But I got the first sermon I preached here. I'm going to auction it off. Well, you know what? I found them at the garage sale for a buck each, so I'll see what I can get here. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things. I have my son Jeff, when he was youth pastor here, he had a big youth group. And they were a very spiritual youth group, very on fire for the Lord. And out of all those kids that were here, only two of them stayed here. You know, either they married, went here, went there, did their own thing. And it's Robert DeVore. And it's G. Whitney, Gordy Whitney. All right, Lord forgive me. But I looked at these two boys. I'm thinking of Robert. I think, oh, gosh. He used to scare us to death in the church. He went through a time. He, I met with him every Wednesday for I don't know how long. But he would yell Jesus as loud as he could, and we would all be like this in the middle of a quiet time. And then he went to, he graduated high school, and he ended up going to Afghanistan. I thought, he'll never come home. That's what I thought. He came home. I said, he'll never get married. He got married. Actually, I've been trying to set him up with Colleen for years. He just, probably vice versa. It didn't work. I said, they'll never have kids. I was thinking, well, next month they'll have two. And here's what I'm thinking. And G. Whitney the same way. I think, Gordy. But you know what? Both of these guys have become faithful at church. And I'm looking for leaders for the future. Maybe not for me, but for the guys coming behind me. And I'm looking for leaders that are younger. And I think, at first, I thought, no way, Jose, nothing. But now I can see these kids got a future. How many are hearing what I'm saying? I correct my vision so I can give these guys a second chance. But if Robert yells at Jesus when I'm quiet, I'll kill him. You know, God's long-term purposes can be accomplished in many short ways. So if you're disappointed, hang in there. God's not finished yet. Hang in there for everything. He's not finished. Because the answer is we walk by faith. We don't see it physically, not by sight. And God's going to get us through. If you just go by what you see, you'd have given up. We're going by what we know is out there. And finally... If you don't take care of it, there's spiritual blindness. Uh, the Bible gives many uh, instances of blindness in, in the Bible. Some of them were just, you're born with it, he healed them. And others, it's like the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel coming out of, the, you know, coming out of Egypt, man, they saw God do things that you and I have never seen done. They've seen, I mean, if you walked, if we went to Lake Huron, somebody was chasing us, and the lake split open on dry ground, wouldn't that change your life forever? I'd be curious to see what fish are in the middle. I've always wondered if they could see that when they were walking through. But they, I mean, they seen that. They were fed from manna, et cetera, et cetera. But as time went on, Jesus even called the Jewish spiritual leaders blind guides. They were spiritually blind. They didn't start out that way, but eventually it happened. Having cataracts... It's so gradual that you don't know you're losing your sight until you're driving at night and it's raining and suddenly everything's got a halo on it. And the doctor told me, he said, hey, wear yellow glasses. You know, can I be honest with you? Yellow glasses aren't cool. How many know what I'm talking about? Just don't look right, but they work at night. And so when I, but when he took, when, when that doctor split my eye open, put a new lens in there, I could not believe the sight I had lost. And here's what I'm saying to you. If you become spiritually blind, it's a gradual thing where you begin to disobey what God says. You begin to put it to the side. And I told people this this morning, and I'm not doing it for myself. The church at the end of January, we took in $15,000 more than we gave out. We're in good shape. Can I tell you that? We're in good shape. But I'm saying this to people here. Listen to pastor. You need to obey God 
and tithe. Bring your offering to the storehouse. You need to do that because there's a promise that goes with that. He is going to make sure things go your way. And all of a sudden, you know, you, if you see things going the other way, it's going to happen. I guarantee it's going to happen. Do it God's way. He's going to bless this church one way or the other. I'm not saying this to get money out of you because we don't need it right now. And there's enough to last me till I'm done here, man. You know, things go bad before I turn it over to a young guy. I'm going to spend every penny we got. <laughs> now, I'm, actually, I'm thinking just the opposite. Israel turned away. God called them blind. And I'll tell you what, he wants to restore our vision. So I, as I give you this final point, 2 Corinthians 5.17, we walk by faith and not by sight. I prayed over these four things because it's so normal. I prayed where the Holy Spirit came upon me and I'm praying in tongues and I'm seeing people's faces and I'm praying, God, give them 2020 vision. So we just don't think, see everything today, but we see things tomorrow. We see both. And here's the four things that I've got. And every, every, everything you've already heard me say, but I prayed that God would help you to read the word and study it. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Some people can read the word, and it's, it's easy. Other people, it goes in spurts. The Bible is interesting, and then it's not. It's interesting, and then it's not. I prayed for you that if you would take that first step, give him 15 or 20 minutes and read that word, and then get the unction to study that word, God's going to give you the attention span and the desire to want to do this. You know, talking to Mike, he had surgery once where he didn't eat for eight days and a popsicle tasted good. But, you know, when you don't eat for a while, you don't want to eat. I remember chewing on ice for about three or four days, and I said, come on, there's got to be more to life than ice. But when you began to eat, you got to get that appetite back. And I'm telling you, I prayed that God would give you back that appetite. Even if you read through the Bible a thousand times or you never read it, that it would become interesting to you. Listen to me. I want that for you. I prayed that for you, and I'm expecting God to answer it. Everyone here, even if you got an interest, that he'd give you more. Second one is to hide the word in your heart and memorize it. We're all tempted by different things. Now, right now, sports betting is coming. It's here. You can bet on the games. You can bet whether there's going to be a touchdown. You can bet. I don't know what. You can bet on everything. You know, and most people can get through that and no problem. But there's three or four or five that get hooked on that. The next thing you know, that casino owns everything you have. Now, if you've got to physically go there, that's one thing. When all you got to do is this, it's going to be awful easy for the wrong person. So can I tell you something? Memorize a scripture. Put it in your heart that, that would stop you from doing that. When you do that, it would stop you. Or if you're a whoremonger, I love that word you got to know. I don't know who invented it, but it's a good word. But if all, you're a womanizer or a menizer, whatever that is, before that happens, have a word in there. You know, I think of this for men going to prostitutes. If you read Proverbs, it's like a, you know, you know Solomon's looking out there and he says, like, man, it's like, it's like a cow going to slaughter, but he doesn't know it. Can I help you? Whatever your temptation is, find the Bible. Memorize the scripture. And I guarantee you, when that temptation comes up, the word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you, boom, it's going to come up. And that's all. I'm telling you the truth. And I know you don't believe me, but I'm telling you, and I prayed that God would want help you want to take that scripture and memorize it. Third thing is, pray the word. Max Lucado wrote this book, Praying the Promises of God. Many people, many different authors, I just happened to be in Ollie's for $3. I bought this book. Go get you one for $3, $3, 30 cans of pop, empty. Go buy this book or a book like it, and it teaches you. In here, he says someone did a study. People get bored with praying because eventually they end up praying the same thing over and over again. And he said, as you begin to pray the promises of God back to him, asking him for answers about this or that, it begins to change your prayer life. So, $3. I'll take $250 for this. Who will give me 3 But But go to Ollie's. 
I mean, it's a discount store. You can buy all kinds of stuff there. But they got a, Christ, a small Christian book section, and the prices are right, but a book that can help you get through. And finally, live it. How many know what I'm talking about? We take it, and we live what the Bible said. I've tried to do that all, all my life. I fail at some points, but I try my best to live the Word of God in front of you. You know, the Bible says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I'm trying my best, and Pat will have to say, I'm better today than I was when I was 19 years old. Am I or am I not? So it's a close call, but it's pretty good. I'll take that. Restored vision. We walk by what? And not by, not by what we see, not by what we hear, but by what? By the word of God and faith. Faith is saying we're going to make it through. I don't care how hard it gets. I don't care if they shut down the churches. We are going to make it. You can't kill the church. You can't do it. The more you persecute us, the stronger we become. We're going to get through this. And if you're in a financial mess, do it God's way. You're going to get out. Your kids are going to, I mean, things are going to happen for you. God's not finished. Romans 8, 28. Something good is going to come back by all this bad stuff that we've heard. COVID-19 is not going to take all my attention. It's not going to stop me from going where I need to go. I'm going to do what I do no matter what. I've always done it. I'm going to continue to do it. And someday it'll be history. We're going to look back at it. Plus, I've got immunity. I'm not worried about it. So if I don't want you to be. You be careful, but don't be fearful. Because God hasn't given us that spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Use your noodle. Use common sense. But I'm praying that God would give you 20 20 spiritual vision. Sometimes he's got to put eye drops in there. He's got to give you a little persecution to wake you up. But you know what? He, he can, you can handle it in Jesus' name. Let's all stand. Oh, thank you, Lord. Come on, let's raise our hands to the Lord.